Well, since the beginning of uh, June of this year, we have walked through many important uh, topics related to the foundations of our faith. And we went through a whole series on systematic theology, and then we talked about our biblical theology, which is covenant theology. And, uh, and then last week, we had uh, Pastor Campbell gave us a great presentation on our form of government. And uh, uh, that is Presbyterianism, as well as some other forms of church government that are used by other denominations. Um, and so tonight, we wrap up with a discussion of something called the doctrine of the regulative, regulative principle of worship. And uh, in the 16th century, the regulative principle of worship could have been summarized in this way uh, by the reformers. And it goes something like this. Whatever is not commanded to be done in worship is forbidden. So whatever God doesn't command us to do is forbidden. And uh, so tonight we have the, the great privilege of having Jack Stoffer uh, open up this topic to us and fill us in on everything that he's been studying hard for about the last week or so, at least that long. So, floor is Jack's. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here. Uh, first of all, just what a great summer of lectures so far. This has really blessed my soul. And I think in particular, just how many men in our congregation who not only love to teach but are gifted at it. So I've, just, I've been so encouraged by all of this. Um, so tonight I have the pleasure of providing our eighth and our final lecture. As Jeff said, we've been going through five weeks of doc the doctrines of grace, salvation. And then a couple weeks on um, covenant theology and church government. And now we are finishing off with the regulative principle of worship. Let me turn this on. There we go. <clears throat> But tonight, yeah, tonight, this topic, unlike all the other ones, doctrines of grace are very agreed upon, especially in, uh, uh, across denominations. But the regulative principle of worship is probably attached with church government that we talked about, the, the most uniquely reformed thing that we are talking about. This, the regulative principle of worship is not something that every evangelical church believes in. And so and I'm going to try to point out those distinctives and what makes it different than other churches. So just to start off, no doubt many of you, like me, when you first came to a church like Christ Reformed or a formed church, you notice, huh, this is a little different. <laughs> this is a little different. Like, this is very different than how I grew up. And so tonight, we're going to, I'm going to hopefully explain to you that everything we do on a Sunday morning has a purpose. Everything that we do on a Sunday morning has a purpose. And most likely, there will be some things that you think are a part of the regulative principle of worship that aren't. And also, there will probably be some things that you think aren't a part of the regulative principle of worship that are. So I hope that as this has blessed me, it will also bless you. Let's start off, though, with a couple quotes on that matter. It's on, yeah. There we go. Cool. So we're going to start off with a quote by Dr. Derek Thomas, who's the current pastor at the church where Dr. Campbell baptized his grandson this morning. Derek Thomas says this. He says, clearly all of life is to be regulated by scripture. There is therefore in one sense a regulative principle for all of life. However, the reformers, John Calvin especially, and the Westminster divines viewed the matter of corporate worship differently. In this instance, a general principle of obedience to scripture is insufficient. There must be a specific prescription governing, governing how God is to be worshipped corporately. In the public worship of God, specific requirements are made, and we are not free either to ignore them or add to them. <clears throat> a shorter quote by yours truly, John Calvin, um, succinctly describes all this. God disapproves of all modes of worship not expressly sanctioned in his word, not expressly commanded in his word. And he talked about this in his uh, short treatise on the necessity of reforming the church. So, before we move forward, let me give you a broad definition of the regulative principle of worship. Then I'll give you an outline for the evening, and then we'll walk through it. So, our definition. Our God demands to be worshipped. The Lord has graciously provided his people through special revelation, namely the word, with the proper elements to worship him. 
And he commands us not to add to those means or to deviate from them. So this is our overarching definition as we walk through the evening. And let me give you an outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. <clears throat> we're going to cover the fact that the Lord demands to be worshipped. I'm guessing this is something hopefully we all agree on. This will start off well. Secondly, that the Lord provides the elements for his worship. I'm going to look at the Old Testament and the New Testament to show this as a broad theme. Thirdly, the Lord commands us not only what we should do, but he commands us not to deviate from those means. Then we'll spend a little bit of time talking about areas of freedom, specifically areas that the regulative principle does not cover. Um, we're going to try to deal with, as well as I can, some common objections to the regulative principle. And then we're going to close with some benefits that we, as a church, believe of the regulative principle of worship. So, buckle in. I'm going to have a lot of scripture passages. I'm going to do my best to try to explain the context as needed. But overall, this is, might be a lot. So just prepare yourselves. <clears throat> so, number one, the Lord demands to be worshipped. This is, our, our God is so great, he's so magnificent, he's so glorious, he's so merciful, he's so kind, and he demands to be worshipped by his creation, as its creator. So when I say the word worship tonight, I'm going to try to give you a small definition for that, just to keep in your mind. When I say worship, I mean a rendering of praise, or ascribing worth, or a recognition of the greatness, perfection, and kindness of the Lord with a thankful and humble heart. I'll say that one more time. Sorry, I don't have it on the slides. Worship is a rendering of praise, ascribing worth, and a recognition of the greatness, perfection, and kindness of the Lord with a thankful and a humble heart. So we have to start here at the, per the, the topic that the Lord demands to be worshipped. Because if we don't start here, these conversations can have a tendency to just kind of be that lack the gravitas that they should. Because we learn that in the scriptures that worship is owed to him. But before we go to the scriptures, we can learn this fact from nature itself. Which the scriptures points out to us, but they're still true from nature. So Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, this is hopefully one that's familiar to you, says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So we just see here, we can look at creation without the Bible and learn that there is a creator who is worth our praise and our thanksgiving. On top of this, even when, when Paul was communicating and debating with the men in Athens, notice this, he quotes some, at the time, secular, uh, ancient poets who said this. In him, speaking of this great deity that even the nations agreed about, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, it's Paul speaking, for we indeed are his offspring. So this just to show, you can learn without the Bible that there is a deity, there is a God who is a creator and deserves to be worshipped. We, all, we also learn this through the scriptures. Although nature can reveal a man's deep need to worship a creator, it does not tell us that we are in need of a redeemer. So here are some passages from the scriptures that teach us that God demands to be worshipped. Psalm 19, the latter half, go, the first half of Psalm 19, talks about looking at the world and all that we can learn about God from the world. And then the second half transitions to God's word and how much more magnificent it is. It's just a small sampling. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, and much more. And then in Deuteronomy 6, the famous uh, Shema of the Israelite nation. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is a command. God is commanding his people to render love and worship to him. Later on in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, 
Uh, there's this verse that Jesus actually quotes when he is um, battling temptation by Satan. It says, It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And then, I believe this is the, the founding verse for our church. Romans 12, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So we're starting, we're laying the groundwork that our God demands and deserves to be worshipped by his creation, which is us. So the, the next question is, how? What then? And once again, this is a question that cannot be answered by just looking at the world. We have to have these methods revealed to us. I'll be talking about the Westminster Confession of Faith, the founding document for our church, quite a bit, because it has wonderful things to say on this topic. So chapter 21 starts with this. It says, The light of nature showeth that there is a God, who hath lordship and sovereignty over all, is good and doeth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart and with all the soul and with all the might. Essentially, everything that I've just said to you. So, and I think this pattern of falling, of, of, of learning that we must worship the Lord and then asking how is a pattern of Christian life, is it not? I, I, I recall back to when I was newly saved and a young Christian and, and learning about all the kind things the Lord had done for me and just welling up in my soul like, I want to give, I want to give back. I, I want to be thankful for this, but, but how? So that's what we will talk about next. Not only does the Lord demand to be worshipped, how then do we worship the Lord? The Lord provides the means for us to worship him. This is not some big question mark. In the scriptures, the Lord provides the means. I'll go ahead and warn you, this is the longest point of the night, so buckle in. just want to let you know that. So observing from the world, we can't, just by looking at the world, we can't discern how to worship the Lord properly. We have to turn to his word. And before I really start talking about this, I just want to point out, this is a point that basically all Christendom agrees upon. Be it Catholics, Lutherans, Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, there is a ton of agreement upon the fact that if we want to worship God rightly, we have to learn what he says to us in his word. Later on, we'll see where there's more disagreement. So first, I'm going to show you how this is a pattern in, both, in the Old Testament. And then I'll show you how it's also a pattern in the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, God always provided the means, elements. I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably, means and elements, for his proper worship. All the way to the beginning. Back in Genesis, in the garden, the Lord created Adam and Eve, placed them in the garden. There wasn't a question mark as to what they were supposed to do to show that they loved and honored the Lord. God was very specific. He said, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. It was not a question. If Adam and Eve longed to show thanksgiving to their God, this is what they should do. So very explicit. Let's fast forward to the time of the nation of Israel. This is just one passage of an ex many examples. How were the people of Israel coming into their promised land meant to render worship to their Savior? Through the tabernacle, primarily. And the sacrificial system. And, and what was that supposed to look like? This is one example of a, of a, of a phrase that is repeated dozens of times. Exodus 25.9. This is God speaking. Exactly according to the pattern that God showed Moses on the mountain. So Moses went up in Mount Sinai and presumably saw in some sense the heavenly courtroom of God. And then God said, you are going to match this pattern in the tabernacle. And interestingly enough, this phrase, as the Lord commanded, and variations of it, is repeated 18 times after the golden calf incident. Over and over and over and over and over. And then in the beginning of Leviticus, again, as Moses is walking through what precisely the sacrificial system is to look like, 
this, some variation of this phrase is another 14 times in the book of Leviticus. Just to prove the point, this, there was no question about what they were to do. God provided the means, and the author of Hebrews points this out as well. So fast forward to the time of the temple, in when David and Solomon were king, sorry, Solomon was king. Could, could Israel worship God wherever they wanted? On any high place? No. Why? Because the Lord designated one spot for his proper worship. You see in, uh, in Deuteronomy 12, verse 11. No, look, look, look down to verse 11. This is God speaking through Moses. It says, Then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices. So this was promised at the time of Moses, and then fast forward to the time of David, it's chosen that it's Mount Zion in Jerusalem, as we see in Psalm 132. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Once again, we see the Lord has provided the pro not only the proper means, but the proper place for him to be worshipped. So what was this temple supposed to look like? Could they do whatever they want? Well, no. As we'll see, uh, during the time of Solomon, it says, In the fourth year, the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid in the month of Ziv. And in the eleventh year, in the month of Bul, which is the eighth month, the house was finished in all its parts. And notice this, and according to all its specifications. According to all its specifications. And we see at the end of the book of Chronicles, this phrase, that this is date, like right towards the end of David's life, when he's passing on all the things he's prepared to his son. This is two very interesting verses. It says, then David gave Solomon, his son, the plan of the vestibule of the temple. There was a plan. And then where did this plan come from? Verse 19 says, All this he, presumably David, made clear to me, Solomon, in the writing from the hand of the Lord. Have you, have you thought about that? that the, the, the way that the temple was constructed, by the phrasing of this verse, it makes it sound like David received something from God, much like Moses did with the tabernacle. So we see a pattern that the Lord provides the proper means for his worship. And I, this pattern continues through the New Testament, albeit with variations. So as we come to the New Testament and Christ the Messiah comes, some questions arise as to, will everything look the same? Will worship be at the same place? Will we have to worship in the temple? And as Jeff mentioned in our call to worship, that's not the case. Because when Christ was talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, he makes some really key comments. And we could dive in really deep in some of this. But for the sake of time, we won't. Because Jesus says to her, this woman, she's asking Jesus about this old, age-old debate. Because the Samaritans worshipped on a mountain in Samaria. And yet the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem and there was disagreement. The Jews are right. And yet Jesus says this. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to Worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Once again, there's a lot to unpack here. But the basics for this point is we no longer have to worship at a singular location. But wherever the spirit is present. And the Holy Spirit is present where God's word is faithfully preached. And where his sacraments are. And where his people are. So in this, this next, we now know that the location of proper worship is not singular. What about the elements of that worship? We don't have a temple. We don't have a tabernacle. We don't have sacrifices. 
Uh, this next part I'm about to get to is a wonderful reformed phrase called means of grace, which no doubt you've heard many times. But means of grace, this is kind of a, a theological shorthand for saying those elements by which we are blessed by God with Christ and we can then render him worship. So that's what I mean by means of grace. It's a very rich term. And this is what the New Testament commands us to do. So I'm going to walk through the various means of grace and their New Testament, um, the verses that, that back them. So how do we worship the Lord now in the New Testament era? Prayer. Prayer is a means of grace. Um, and we have several verses that go along with this. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, Paul says this. He says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be med made for all people. Further down in verse 8, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. This is, this is not a suggestion. Paul is saying, to be a faithful Christian, you must pray. And I'm going to make this delineation a lot. Paul is using the plural here. There is a place for private prayer. And it, you know, hopefully as Christians, we all love praying privately. And yet we would do well to remember that prayer is primarily a corporate means of grace. Which means when you're here on Sunday and the pastor or the elder is leading you in prayer, this is, you're not just listening. He is praying on behalf of every single one of you. A couple other verses on prayer. Philippians 4, 6, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Once again, plural. Talking about the congregation of Christians. And most obviously, which we do every Sunday, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount has this, he says, And when you pray, do not be like this. When you pray, do not be like this. But this then is how you should pray. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer. Once again, we don't say, my Father. What do we say? We say, our Father. Even baked into the Sermon on the Mount is this assumption of plurality. This assumption that the means of grace are primarily corporate and secondarily private. And that delineation belongs to most of the means of grace, I would say. Secondly, we have the sacraments. There are two things that Christ himself, while he was on the earth, commanded his church to do until the end of this age. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Two things commanded by Christ. And the sacraments comes from the Latin word sacramentum, which basically means an action by us, solidifying our relationship with God. There's a bigger debate behind that, but we'll just keep calling them sacraments. So these are acts of worship, whereby God gives us Jesus in very real spiritual ways. And we solidify our relationship to him. They're signs and seals. So we have baptism. The end of Matthew, uh, Jesus says, Go therefore, this is the Great Commission, and make disciples of all nations. Nations, baptizing them. You cannot make disciples apart from baptizing them. Baptizing them in the name of the Trinitarian formula, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this continues in the book of Acts. Because, you know, Peter, after his great Pentecost sermon, says, repent and be baptized. It was an interesting thing. I believe it was earlier this year where someone was joining our church, but before they joined our church, they had to be baptized because you can't be a part of the church without having the, the covenant seal. So those two are just intrinsically connected. To be a part of the Lord's church is to be baptized and vice versa in many ways. So once again, there is a, a private public delineation. There are some instances in which sacraments, such as the Lord's Supper or baptism, could be administered privately, say if someone is aging and can't leave their house. There's a totally appropriate time for the elders to bring them communion. Or say in a deathbed conversion, absolutely, that person should get baptized. But in general, sacraments are for the edification of everyone. 
and not just the person who's getting blessed by it. So right, we also have the Lord's Supper, which Jesus, on the last night he was with his disciples, having the Passover meal, he, he, he reconfigured it in a sense, symbolizing not just the exodus, but his own spiritual exodus on the cross. Saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And this is another means of grace that we follow. After this, um, once again, as I said, there's a private, public delineation here. After this, we're commanded in the New Testament to worship the Lord through the singing of psalms. I know this will upset Jeff. And hymns. (laughs) Love you, Jeff. Um, Singing of psalms and hymns. God also commands us in today's day and age to render him worship through singing. It's not just something that churches are like, you know what? We really like music. No, God commands it. And here's some verses. Colossians 3.16. Paul says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. How on earth are we supposed to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly? By singing. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And Ephesians 5.19. He's saying, don't get drunk with wine, get drunk with the Spirit, basically. (laughs) How do we do that? By singing. Singing to one another. These songs, which happens all through the Bible. When Moses, right after the Exodus, the Egyptians perished in the sea, what did they do? They sang a great song. When Hannah conceived with Samuel, what did she do? She sang a great song. When David had wonderful victories, he sang a great song. So this is a pattern of God's people. Uh, And also James chapter 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Literally, let him sing uh, a hymn. It's just a side note. I've talked with a lot of people who struggle with uh, being edified by singing, in particular, like in church or in uh, or Bible studies or whatnot. <clears throat> and I get that. I grew up singing. A lot of people didn't. It's fair. Just a couple points that helped me to remember the importance of singing. When this world was made, the angels sang. And when this age ends, the church will be singing for forever. And so that's beautiful. Like, those of us who have great voices now will pale in comparison to the voices of our resurrected bodies. And the same is entirely true for those of you who are maybe uncomfortable with your singing. Someday the Lord will change that. That's such a beautiful thing. That's just, I don't know. I like thinking about that. Thank you, God. <laughs> amen. Amen. Another mean of, means of grace. Reading and the preaching of God's word. This is a means of grace. How do we see this? First, um, we, we see a couple verses talking about the reading of God's word. After Paul, he's about to give one of his big addresses in the books of Acts. It says, From ancient generations Moses had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read, it's the first five books of the Bible, every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is a pattern, the reading of God's word. Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and the ones who hears. Matthew 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Just want to ask you, did you realize that when you're, when you're by yourself and you're reading God's word, that's an act of worship when you read in faith. Also, when God's word is just being read, like when Dr. Campbell is just reading it before the sermon, that's worship. God is speaking when his word is read. So what about preaching? Preaching is, preaching, the Greek word means a herald, an announcement, a declaration. It's not a back and forth dialogue. It's a proclamation of what God is saying. And we see that commanded in the New Testament as well. Matthew 4, 17, the primary portion of Jesus' ministry on earth was preaching. Did he heal? Absolutely. But he always healed after he preached. I don't think it was ever the reverse. Paul in 2 Timothy, he says, I charge you, speaking to this young pastor, 
I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. That's a long intro. Preach the word. This is a command. This is not a, a maybe for Timothy. He must preach the gospel of God. We also see this in the beginning of the church. In Acts 2, it says, And they, the early church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And then later in Acts 6, we show the primacy of preaching in the early church, that when this problem of the widows, the Greek widows, not getting enough food, the apostles said, this is an important issue, we've got to deal with it, but preaching is more important. Very important distinction. So, the public-private delineation here is that you can read the Bible wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. You, you can't really preach without people. So, preaching, whenever it's commanded, is fundamentally corporate. Corporate means of grace. And all this may be summarized, once again, by a great part of the Westminster Confession, chapter 21. It says, prayer and thanksgiving being one special part of religious worship is by God required of all men. Not only that, the reading of the scriptures with godly fear, the sound preaching and consciousable hearing of the word, in obedience unto God with understanding, faith and reverence, singing of psalms with grace in the heart, as also the due administration and worthy receiving of the sacraments. You'll notice there's a couple means of grace under here that I'm not mentioning just for the sake of time. But, in certain circumstances, religious oaths, the creed, baptism, marriage, uh, membership vows, these are all means of grace commanded by the New Testament. Also, uh, solemn fastings. It's a pattern of God's people in times of sorrow or deliberate sin to command a corporate fast. I don't know what that would look like. I, I personally haven't been in that situation. But I know it would be appropriate in certain, say, say our country was attacked. Yeah, we should fast and seek the Lord together. And Thanksgivings, like our, uh, some churches do Christmas Eve services. Is that commanded? No. But it's a special Thanksgiving service for a special reason. So, as I've said, there is a profound amount of agreement on all of these points. So many different churches do this. And yet, this next point is more distinctly reformed. And this is the meat of the regulative principle of worship. The fact that not only does the Lord command us what to do, the Lord commands us not to deviate from those provided means. The Lord commands us not to deviate from those provided means means. His word not only positively tells us what to do, it negatively regulates and restricts our means of worship. Let me read the second half of point one of chapter 21. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scriptures. That about covers it. But there's a lot of backing to this. Let me show you. This begins all the way back in the Old Testament. So we'll start Old Testament again, move to New Testament. Um, sorry, I missed a point. Why is this so important? There's a wonderful quote by Calvin, which I think gets to the idea about why it's so important that we are regulated to the means of grace. He says this one powerful phrase. He says, Veritably, the human heart is a factory of idols. When in doubt, Humans will make idols of what they see when in doubt. If you look through the whole pattern of Scripture, and it's just a truth. So there's safety in what we're about to talk about. Not only safety, but prudence and obedience. So, let's walk through it. Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we see this begin even in Exodus 20 with the Ten Commandments. God starts off and says, You shall have no other gods before me. But not only that... 
don't try to worship me in a way that I haven't told you to. With an idol or an image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven or anything that is in the earth or anything in the water. Basically, God is saying, I'm invisible. Worship me only through the ways that I told you to. Essentially. Now fast forward to this. This is Dr. Campbell's favorite go-to passage on this subject. In Leviticus chapter 10, there's a very interesting little, um, little narrative portion in chapter 10. So the book of Leviticus is mostly about the sacrificial system. But then you get to chapter 10. In chapter 9, I believe, the Lord is commanding the people about how to, how to use the censers, like the, the, the um, how do I describe it, the fire within the tabernacle. And he deliberately says, do not offer before me strange fire. Something else that I haven't told you. And then chapter 10 begins with this sobering picture. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, the sons of the high priest, each took his censer and put a fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire. Some other translations say strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Man, that's sobering. They offered strange fire, which God deliberately told them not to in the previous chapter. What was it exactly? We don't know. That doesn't matter. What matters is that they deviated from God's prescribed pattern. And it's important to note, God obviously doesn't always do this. He doesn't always burst out with fire and lightning and kill those who do something wrong. But sometimes he does to teach us and to humble us like he did with Israel. Book of Deuteronomy says this. um, Chapter 4. Moses is saying, you shall not add to the word that I commanded you, nor take from it. That you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Interestingly, this phrasing is used in the book of Revelation too. So from the beginning to the end of the Bible, you have this overarching principle of the Lord is commanded. Don't add to it and don't take away from it. And then, you know, the ongoing theme in the book of Judges is not necessarily that they weren't doing the right things. It's that they were adding to them. By adding, in those days there was no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in 2 Samuel, there's another sobering picture like that of Nadab and Abihu. When when David is bringing the ark into Jerusalem, and the ark is on a cart. And in the book of Moses, it's deliberately said that the ark is supposed to be carried on poles, and not on a cart. Now you might be thinking, why is that a big deal? Well, let's see. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. Seems innocent. For the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error. God's not being unjust here. At all. It's very, very sobering, and yet they were not worshiping God precisely as he commanded. One last passage from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah 19. What I want to focus on is this phrase down in verse 5, where they were doing all these things, but notice what he says in verse 5. The Lord says, you're doing all of these terrible things, which I did not command or decree. Once again, we see this pattern. Not only does God provide us what to do, the assumption behind that, more than an assumption, is that you don't deviate from those things. Because idolatry comes when we do that. And I'd say that this pattern continues in the New Testament as well. Let me give you several verses. Matthew chapter 15, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, you know, who basically, if anything negative is in the Gospels, it's about the Pharisees. It's a safe bet. Jesus says, you hypocrites! Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The doctrines of men are not proper ways to worship the Lord. 
I'll talk more about this at the end, but a church, a pulpit, and some of you have seen this, has a remarkable amount of power over people. People listen to what pastors say because they trust them. And so you have to ask the question, are the things that we're commanding from the pulpit, are those the things that God also commands? Because if there's a deviation, churches deal in the business of souls. There could be a lot of pain and hurt there. Because anything outside the scripture is ultimately a commandment of men. Colossians chapter 2. Paul is writing to this church that, once again, wasn't necessarily doing anything. They were doing everything they were supposed to. The problem was they were adding to it. Notice this passage. He's saying, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, according to human precepts and teaching. These things, you know, Paul doesn't really tell us what these things are, because it doesn't matter. The point is, is they weren't commanded. These things have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. That phrase in verse 23 is very important. Notice what he's saying. He's saying these things, he describes them as self-made religion. The, the word there literally means desire worship, will worship, whatever works. Something that came, that, that, that came from man's brain rather than the Lord's word. And so that's, that's an important point to think about because it's really easy as Christians, as you're seeking maturity in faith, for your, for your reasoning to be, well, this is working. So let's keep doing it. I think that's what this church was trying to do. They were trying to, they were, they were trying to grow their own faith by their own means rather than trusting God's ways. Which comes us to this overarching principle. Love this verse. Romans 10, 17. Paul says, so faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of Christ. This is so important. Why does this matter? Because fallen human beings, we are constantly tempted by our flesh and the world to worship God in strange and new ways. But we must be regulated by his word. Because what do we want? Ultimately, every single one of us here would agree on this. We desire not only for our faith to grow, but to impart the faith in Jesus Christ to our loved ones, to your children, to your friends. Is that, that's a goal. We want to invite the brethren around us into heavenly dwellings, as Luke 16 says. And yet, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. Do, you, do, you, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that? Or do we not sometimes falter and think that coercion, brilliance, a really good argument, or maybe are some rituals, things you can see, that'll convince my kid, that'll convince my friend, rather than the words of Christ. The passion of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God, but his word does. It's a beautiful promise. And this is why, as we move forward, our, our services here of Christ Reform, this is the first thing that I noticed when I came here, are saturated with the Word of God. Because we firmly believe that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of Christ. So now that we've talked about the fact that the Lord gives us the proper means and commands us to not deviate, let's talk about some areas of freedom. Things in w that the regular principle leaves freedom for. So there's a delineation. There's the elements of worship. Those are the big things. Prayer, sacraments, preaching. And then there's the circumstances. Um, sorry, yeah, I already talked about that. Elements versus circumstances. Circumstances are all the questions surrounding the elements. Let me ask some. What is the precise order of worship? There's a lot of freedom there. I've been to some churches that uh, have a confession of sin, you know, after the sermon. I've had been to some services that have the sermon earlier than other. There's a lot of freedom. Should we sing first on Sunday? Should we pray first? 
There's really no thus saith the Lord's. There's a lot of freedom. Um, in many areas, there's no precise direction from the scriptures. And in those senses, there, there's freedom in each church deciding what it should do. Uh, what passages should we preach? Uh, it's up to Dr. Campbell. Well, more people. Yeah, it's up to you, basically. How long should a sermon be? Also up to Dr. Campbell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> long, right? That's what matters. Because if faith comes by hearing, then the more that we hear, the... Oh, wait, never mind. Um, when should we meet? Anyone up for 5 a.m.? I don't know. I would be. I don't think my wife would. But, you know, the t- there, there's, there's no precise direction on some of these things. All we know is, you know, we're supposed to meet on Sunday. How often should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? This is a big one. A lot of people can get really antsy about this. Uh, there, there is no precise direction. Is there wisdom? Yes. Are there principles? Yes. But there's no precise direction. What songs should we sing? How should we sing them? I mean, this is another big one. Like, should we sing new songs? Should we sing old songs? Should we sing ones only made in the 50s? What about the early 2000s? Like that phase that everyone grew up hearing on the radio? There's a lot of freedom. The question is, is it based on the Bible and wisdom? What instruments should we use? Should we have a choir, a projector, a hymnal? It's a lot of freedom. The Bible doesn't say. Now, personally, the perspective of this church is that hymnology, the use of hymnals, is an excellent way of preserving Uh, mentally the words of songs, and I believe that firmly. But I have to be honest and say that a church that uses a projector and doesn't have a hymnal or a piano in the back can still be a regulative principal church because there's freedom. We can do things because we, in our house of the Lord, determine them to be best without looking at someone else and saying, no, that's not regulative principal. So there's a lot of freedom here. Um... Basically, it all comes under this one verse that Paul uses after this long discussion about how prophecy should be handled in the early church. And he says, everything should be done decently and in good order. As long as it's decent, done well, and done in good order, and the elements are there, there's freedom. And one other thing that I forgot to put um, in this slideshow I want to mention, there's a lot of freedom in private edification versus public edification. Say you have some routine, I don't know, of what you do to get reading the Bible in the morning or, you know, going on a run or something or being in nature that really helps you to pray. That's great. The regular principle doesn't say you can't do that. But what it, there is a big difference between me saying going to the Rocky River Nature Park helps me to read and contemplate scripture. Therefore, you have to, too. There's a big difference. There's a difference between private and public edification. So we're on our last two points. Common objections to the regulative principle of worship. First one, show me the verse. I've gotten this before. You know, these are the big scaries. You're like, oh my gosh, I didn't, wasn't prepared for that. Show me the verse. There are people out there. These kind of people, they, they will believe nothing unless you show them a verse that says, I am the Lord and the regulative principle of worship is the way you should go. And you're like, oh man, it doesn't exist. We're doomed. Very close to the, you're being a legalist. I've gotten that, that objection as well. I'll try to respond to both of these um, real quick. So these kind of people usually, not always, will, won't take your word for it unless you show them a very, very clear, incredibly point-by-point regulative principle of worship verse. And it doesn't exist. Why? Because as you've seen, it's an all-scripture principle. But I, I do have some recommendations. Um, it's, it's difficult to respond to these things quickly with that one verse that someone wants. This is what I recommend. Choose one of the couple narrative passages and then just let the person soak in that. Like say, Nadab and Abihu. Just be like, okay, hey, hey, let's read Leviticus 10 real quick. And then to the legalists say, would Aaron have been legalistic if he came in and tried to stop his sons? No. He actually would have been faithful if he had done that. And just let them make the person wrestle with the justice and the holiness of God. God didn't have to burn them up, but he was certainly just too. So, those are two common objections. And then, 
Probably the most common objection is the, what's called the normative principle of worship. This is the, uh, you could say, the opposing view to the regulative principle. Here's a basic definition. Uh, we may freely worship God in any way as long as his positive commands are followed, none of his negative commands are broken, and the practice is agreeable with church unity and peace. Sounds really good, right, on the surface. If you, this is basically the perspective is we're going to be staunch in what we know and yet really, really hands off in what we don't know. Really big on freedom. Uh, Lutheran church believes this. Uh, many Anglican churches, a lot of Baptist churches, and certainly the Roman Catholic church follows this idea. Um, some ex uh, some examples of things that they, 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 the, these kind of churches would be fine with having in their service. Uh, rituals, drama, medium dan media, dancing, not always these things. But let me give some examples. Uh, what's a ritual? Um, I've been to Baptist churches before where, as a part of the, uh, the Sunday morning worship, everyone writes their sins on a note card and you go and nail it on a cross. On the surface, there's nothing bad about that, right? You know, maybe it has some deep spiritual meaning. But is it commanded for the corporate church to do together? No. So it's kind of a ritual, a pietistic ritual or a drama. I got to be honest, I have been in a church drama before in my church growing up. Not very edifying, either for the participants or the actors. I speak from experience. Or media. What about using a, a movie clip to really make your sermon like pop? Right, Dr. Campbell, you ever thought about that? <laughs> Faith comes by hearing. Are we allowed to deviate from that? Or dancing, yes, I have heard of collegiate ministries have dance teams on stage. This is real. You know, churches are asking these questions. And the thought process would be, well, the Bible doesn't tell us to dance, but it also doesn't tell us not to, so we're good. So that's the normative principle of worship. And a lot of times their point will be, well, worship is ultimately from the heart. So if I'm worshiping the Lord from my heart and my soul, how can you critique that? And we Reformed people can be very quick to shove that under the rug. But the reality is that's actually a really strong objection, biblically. I'm going to point that out. I still disagree with it, but it's still strong. Um, because here's the fact. It is a scriptural truth that worship begins at the heart level. Um, Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. I can't see that. You can't see that. Hosea 6.6, 6, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Can you see mercy in someone's heart? No. You can see the actions, but not the, not the heart. I apologize, this first reference is wrong. It's 1 Samuel 16, 7, I believe, where Samuel's with finding David, and the Lord says, the Lord does not see as a man sees. Man looks with his eyes, but the Lord looks at the heart. So sometimes in Scripture, people doing the right thing are condemned. This does happen. Most famously, I'll just talk about Amos. This verse in Amos, the Lord says, I hate your festivals. I hate the things that you're doing that I commanded. Why? Because their heart wasn't in it. So, all that to say, this whole worship from the heart is actually a strong objection, and there's more. So here's some scripture passages that seem to support the normative principle of worship. First of all, the, I'll summarize these. Uh, the story of Naaman the Syrian. Perhaps you remember this. Naaman the Syrian was a, a, a general in the Syrian army who had leprosy. And so he came to Israel to find a prophet because he heard about the prophet from a slave girl that his wife had. Long story. And the prophet told him to bathe in the Jordan River. And at the very end, there's this very interesting little end part that like regulative principle people are like, don't like. Because Naaman, after he's healed, is like, oh, by the way, I have to go bow to my God, Rimon, because of my job. Can God forgive me? And Elijah says, peace be with you. We're like, what? No, it can't be. This, this is a legitimate story that people might use. And there's, there's some credibility there. I'll deal with that in a second. Another one is Hezekiah's Passover. 
in 2 Chronicles. A very interesting story where Hezekiah, after the Passover hasn't been celebrated in centuries, sends out letters to gather all the people of Israel together to celebrate the Passover. And in order to do that, they have to be ceremonially clean. And while they're on the, basically, they show up late, and half the tribes aren't ceremonially clean. And so Hezekiah's like, what gives, y'all? What do we do now? And what he does is he turns to the Lord and says, God, please help us. And God says, you're healed. Have the Passover. What, what about the rules? So once again, you see there's this, it's not always cut and dry. But I'll explain it in a second. Lastly, in the New Testament and the Old Testament, the, 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 the subject of God-fearing Gentiles exists. So Gentiles who aren't circumcised, most likely, they're not going to the temple, maybe as much as Jews, and yet they're, God honors their worship. How does this mesh with the regulative principle? Here's my response. All such examples of these freedoms are showcasing not God's indifference, but his mercy. Not his indifference, but his mercy. Would God have been just if he had said to Naaman, no, do not go to that God's altar? Yes, he would have. But he's showing mercy. Would God have been just if with Hezekiah he had said, sorry, no Passover? Yes, but he showed mercy. So I think the principle here is that God is the same today as he was then. And yet we cannot presume upon the Lord's mercy in how we run our Sundays. Yes, we rejoice when he shows mercy, but that doesn't mean, like maybe Nadab and Abihu, we can just be like, he's, he's shown mercy before, he'll do it again. It's not always true. Um... Let's talk about some benefits of the regulative principle. Last slide. Uh, stole these shamelessly from my professor, Kevin DeYoung. Just give him a shout out. The regulative principle of worship gives us freedom from an ever-changing cultural pressure. The world right now, uh, just talking to people like Mimi and Sterling around us, is a different world than 70 years ago, right? Very different world. A lot of different cultural pressures. And if we stick firmly to what the Bible tells us to do when we don't drift, guess what? A church 70 years from now is going to look remarkably the same. We have a freedom to say no to things. Secondly, it gives us a freedom from fighting over preferences. You realize if you have that big bubble of freedom that says, well, the Lord hasn't told us to do it, and he hasn't told us not to do it, therefore it's free game. Well, then it's a war. What if you have seven elders who all love different preferences, preferences and they can't figure out what to do? I don't know. But if we settle on, okay, what does the Bible tell us to do? It's very simple. It's very simple. Freedom, this is my favorite point. Freedom from burdening consciences. Remember what I said earlier about just because something is edifying to me does not mean that it is edifying to you. So there, there is a profound difference between me having a personal practice of piety, of how often I fast, or how often I pray, or how specifically I read the Bible, or insert some ritual, some church calendar practice, some, I don't know, insert any ritual. It's a big difference between saying, that really helps me in my faith, and saying, therefore, it must help yours. Because God alone is the God of the conscience. So, we protect the consciences of God's sheep when we only command that which we can hardly say, God says you must do this. Which is why our services look the way they do. And then, last one. Regulative principle of worship gives us freedom to focus entirely on the center, which is Jesus Christ. When you're battling on peripheral things and you're arguing, and there's discussions about what can we add, what can we take away, what can we change, all these kind of things. If you push that aside and say, we're only going to do what the Bible tells us to do, I think it's incredibly easier to focus on worshiping Jesus Christ. Because that's what the scriptures do. And this is, if all of our conversations are about the scriptures and what's in them, I think all of a sudden our minds will be on the scriptures more. 
So there you have it. Here are some references uh, the Bible. Westminster Confession of Faith, The Church of Christ by a very, really old Presbyterian named James Bannerman. It's like a thousand pages. I don't recommend it. But <laughs> Institutes of the Christian Religion with John Calvin. Recommend that. That's really good. Confessing the Faith by Chad Van Dixor. And I believe Dr. Starkey used this book as well. Very good. Uh, Westminster Confession of Faith by G.I. Williamson. Also, I am a huge fan of Martin Luther, and I disagree with him on this. He's a, he's a big normative principle guy, and I've read a lot of his stuff. So I've also, I couldn't really give any one, but a lot of his things. I hope you recognize just how little we delved into this topic. It's just a, just a pinprick. Books upon books have been written. Um, but feel free to ask questions. I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but one last thing. A regulative principle of worship does not mean that you can't go down the street to a church that's not regulative principle and worship. That's not, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that everybody who's not regulative principle are heretics. That's not what it means. It does mean that for this particular body of Christ and our elders at this church, we deem it to be the most edifying way of worshiping Christ is to follow the regulative principle. So as RTS's motto, we want to be reformed, yet we want to be winsome about it. Let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it teaches us so many things. Lord, I pray that we all would long to, to drink deeply of the well of the scriptures and to study them and to be approved workmen in your vineyard. I pray that we would uh, ask good questions, wrestle with the text, and be blessed by um, this church. I ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.